So we're in this series, this, this sermon series now, talking about personal ministry, because that's our focus this year in the life of the church, 2014, trying to figure out how each of us are involved in personal ministry. And here's the, here's the statement that we're using that, that helps us define what personal ministry is this year. Fulfilling the calling God has on your life to serve others, and of course that means in His name, in God's name. So in our first sermon series, uh, first sermon in the series, we talked about God's call and, and the difference it made to us that God is giving us the call. And then we talked about how it's God's call. It's the call God has in our lives that is important. And so now today what we're going to do is shift our attention a little bit and look at the idea that it's God's call in my life. God's call in your life. God's call in each of our lives. Because the truth is, personal ministry is God's plan for each of our lives. Remember, that's part of the beauty of the purpose that we have of the intelligent design of creation. That the needs of the world and and our call match up perfectly together. And so today we're going to look at that idea about God's call in my life. Personal ministry is based on serving, on servanthood. And we're going to talk more about that next week and just mention this about it today. God has designed the church, that's us, the body of Christ, as a servant for the world. And that's, that's why our emphasis on missions and our emphasis on outreach is so critical among us, because that's God's purpose for us. And I want us to remember that one of the images that the prophets shared about the coming Messiah was this idea that he was a suffering servant for the world, Christ, the Messiah. And we are members of Christ's body. Therefore, as individual members of his body, we are each contributing servants in the world. And God shows us that clearly in scriptures. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list some of them for us so that we can capture this sense. For example, God creates us for ministry. God has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works, which God planned in advance for us, to live our lives doing. That's what Paul told the early church in Ephesus. And then God saves us for ministry. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, God who gives us the strength to do that, saved us and made us his holy people. That was not because of anything we did ourselves, but because of God's purpose and grace. God creates us, God saves us, God calls us to ministry. Peter wrote to the early Christians, and he said, but you are a chosen people, royal priests, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. You were chosen to tell about the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. At one time, You were not a people, but now you are God's people. And then God gifts us for ministry. Peter again says, God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other, passing on to others God's 
many kinds of blessings. Now, God also commissions us through Christ for ministry. We call this the Great Commission. And we take it seriously in our role as disciples. Jesus came to them and said, All power in heaven and on earth is given to me. So, go and make followers of all people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything that I have taught you. And I will be with you always, even until the end of this age. Go and make followers. Go and make disciples. So we are disciples, and we're in the process of making disciples. It's part of what God's purpose for us is. So God has commissioned us. God also exhorts us into servant ministry. Jesus said, But it should not be that way among you. Whoever wants to be great among you must serve the rest of you like a servant. Whoever wants to become first among you must serve the rest like a slave. In the same way, the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many people. God also prepares us for ministry. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, and he said, And Christ gave gifts to people. He made some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to go and tell the good news, and some to have the work of caring and teaching God's people. Christ gave those gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving to make the body of Christ stronger. Our our ministry is needed. We are needed in ministry. Paul says, together, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of that body. We all know all of our body parts are needed. We're accountable. We're rewarded according to our ministry. Again, Paul says, in all the work you are doing, work the best you can. Work as if You were doing it for the Lord and not for people. Remember that you will receive your reward from the Lord, which He promised to His people. You are serving the Lord Christ. And we are important in our ministry. In each body part, Paul says, if each body, each part of the body were the same part, there'd be no real body. But truly, God put all of the parts, each of them, into the body as He wanted them. So, then there are many parts, but only one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. No. Those parts of the body that seem to be the weaker are really necessary. Now, just in these ten references that that we went through right now, you can see that this idea of personal ministry is not an afterthought. It's not an add-on or a tack-on. 
Clearly, it's the purpose and design that God has. You know, each of us have a shape. All of us, all of us are conscious of our shape. I mean, everybody here who has a mirror in their bedroom, raise your hand. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Some of you are kidding yourselves. There's a mirror in there. Now, physically, we are all conscious of our shape. And I'm not really going to go there because I would probably just stir up too much stuff. And besides that, remember, everything is spiritual. So let's focus on our spiritual shape given to us by God. Although, let me just say, here's the reality. Bottom line. Our spiritual shape includes our physical shape. And we have responsibility for both of them. And maybe the ultimate question is, what shape is my shape in? But here's the tie-in. My personal ministry is an expression of my shape. So let's explore what we're talking about with shape. Let's start with the S. Shape is about spiritual gift abilities. The gift of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Each of us have at least one. Paul says, I wish that everyone were like me. But each person has his own gift from God. One has one gift, and another has another gift. And our shape also involves our heart, our values, our morals, our priorities, our passion. Solomon says, above all else, guard your heart. Because it's the wellspring of life. And our shape is about our abilities, talents, skill sets, aptitudes that have been created into us. Paul says we all have different gifts. Each of them came because of God's grace. A person who has the gift of prophecy should use that gift in agreement with the faith that he has been given. A shape also involves our personality. The thing that makes me, me. Why we are unique individuals. Because that accounts for what I do. Talking about King David, it says, his father had never interfered with him by asking, why do you behave as you do? Each of us has a personality. and We behave a certain way. And then our shape is about our experience. Even if we grow up in the same family, our experiences are not identical. Each of us have our own experience. It's the way we put things together that creates anything new under the sun. There aren't any new discoveries. There aren't any new truths. It's how those things are combined together in relationship to our experience that brings new revelations. Again, Solomon says, I thought to myself, look, 
I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Now, God has given me this shape for the purpose of personal ministry. So what God wants me to do is to discover my shape. Become personally aware of those features that God has poured into my life for my ministry. Paul says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Discover what it is, how it is that God has made me. God also wants me to accept my shape. You know, we run into the problem of comparison. It's a temptation for us to compare ourselves. Not about comparing. It's about accepting who I am. But in any case, each of you should continue to live the way God has given you to live. The way you were when God called you. This is a rule I make in all of the churches, Paul says. And God wants me to enjoy my shape. In fact, Solomon once again says, to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, that's a gift from God. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. God also wants me to develop my shape. A diamond in the rough, so to speak. Paul encourages Timothy and he says, this is why I remind you to keep using the gift God gave you when I laid hands on you. Now, let it grow as a small flame grows into a fire. And finally, God wants me to deploy my shape. God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other, passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. And that's such a great statement. I just want you to repeat it with me. So repeat after me. God has given each of you special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other. Now, let's make it personal and try it again. God has given me special abilities. I will be sure to use them to help others. So here it is. We belong to Christ who came to serve and not to be served. We are each members of Christ's body. So I want us to see how that really works in terms of being a servant in the world. So I'm going to try to help us envision this this illustration, this scenario. I'm going to describe a scenario here that, that I hope helps illustrate this in our lives. I want you to think about having a special dinner in a home that that has a formal dining room set aside from the kitchen. And there is uh, an intimate group there, say a group of 10 or 12 people. 
some of them family, maybe some of them friends, who have been invited for a special dinner, some special occasion. Don't know what the occasion is, but there's a, a special dinner. And, and special preparations have been made. The good china is out, and, and the crystal is out, and, and the silver is out, and, and it's just a, a nice formal dinner. And, and part of the dinner is a special dessert, a special parfait that's been made with the, with the stripes in it, and it's just a special time. So dinner is over, and we've kind of cleared the table off a little bit, and we're getting ready for the parfait dessert, and, and one, of the, one of the younger members asks if, if they could please help, you know, and, 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 and so they're carrying the tray of, of parfaits into the dining room, and sure enough, as they swing the tray off of the counter and begin the trip into the dining room, the tray tilts and the parfaits crash to the floor, smashing and breaking up, and there's a huge mess everywhere, a loud noise. Everyone's startled and jumps. There's a, the scream of, of the child who who's has it, and, and wow, there we have a situation. Now, in that situation, what I want us to imagine, what I want us to think about are the possibilities for personal ministry there. And one of the ways to think about the possibilities that exist in that is to think about, well, what's needed? What's, what, what's next? What's needed next in this situation? Because that will, that will generate an answer to what are the possibilities for personal ministry. Let's look at a few of them. For example, someone needs to pick up the broken glass carefully from the broken parfait glasses. That's a need. Someone can do that. Someone needs to clean up the floor, first from the food that's on the floor, and then probably mop or sweep or wipe or get a damp cloth and try to clean the floor. Someone needs to probably get next to the child that dropped it and reassure that child and make sure the child's okay and comfort that child and, and minister to that child. Someone needs to probably think about some kind of an alternative dessert because we're not having parfait. Someone has the opportunity to kind of coordinate, maybe even administrate all the efforts. You go get the mop and the pail. You go get the dust broom. You go get, you go. And then there's always the opportunity for someone to maintain a positive attitude. Maybe even introduce a little bit of humor so that everyone is led in a in an experience that this doesn't turn into a disaster, but, but it ends up being an occasion where we simply have a little hiccup and then we move on with our party and the party continues on. See, there's already, just thinking off the top of our heads, there's six opportunities for personal ministry. How will those needs, how will those needs be met? Who will fill those needs? Will people respond on their own to those needs? Or will some of them need to be asked to fill those needs? What happens if nobody really gets up? to fill those needs. What happens if one person gets up? Or maybe two people get up to fill those needs. What would happen 
if everybody there got up and did something. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for making us members of this church, making us members of Christ's body. Each of us being a part of it. Each of us having our own personal ministry. Each of us needed. Even this morning, Father, help us realize how real and how important that is. That we would each be convinced and motivated to jump up and help. In Christ's name, amen.